I think every generation as young people are self-absorbed. <laughs> I think that's how nature works. Mm. But the realization is that I can learn. Don't close yourself off to learning. Because when you're on set with somebody who's gone through the trenches and has come to where they are, they didn't get there by fluke. Mm -hmm. They've done something, watch and learn. Always be open to learning. Because when even I have learned things, I learned things from younger people Ooh. and it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. You know, mm. it's energizing and it, and it gives me the courage to go on and, and mm. to be better myself. Yeah. Because they're watching. Mm. They're always watching us. Mm. And if we put up a good example for them, then there's something for them to learn. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another exciting episode of A Film This Show. The show where we delve into industry professionals' minds to discover their insights on the current landscape of the film and television industry, both locally and internationally. Please subscribe, like, comment, and turn on the notification button so you are aware of our future episodes that you will love so much. On today's episode, we're bringing someone we all know who's graced our screens and theater stages for quite some time. Someone that we love and know as South Africans. She's a multi-award winning international actress, singer, musical theater performer, and voice artist. She got her grounding in theater after attending the University of Pretoria. And then that's where she excelled, landing roles that won her awards such as the Gagnet Fiesta for Crystal Flachter, Big Band Blast and Scorched, landing her an Aledi Award for, for the role. She's also worked in international productions like Mamma Mia, Rent, Menopause, the musical, and Fiddler on the Roof, to name a few. She graced the silver screens too on productions such as Isidingo, Sievedilan, Lockdown, Diamond City, Nerens Nuerkap, Spurlos, Four, Arons Flay, Unseen and Sturmop, which landed her a Golden Horn Award. Alan Pakis, Disak, Anna, Cold Harbor, and Mayfair, just to name a few. Everyone, please, let's welcome the lovely and ever so talented Ilsa Klink. Welcome, Ilsa. Thank you so much, Marcus. Yes, it's lovely to be coming. here. Yeah, what a, it's a real honor and, and pleasure to have you here. You know, um, we are, we are going through a lot as Johannesburg citizens, you know, so I'm glad you can come and join us in our offices here in the CBD and just to have a, a conversation. Yeah, really, Thank you. It really is a pleasure. I mean, you know, whether you acknowledge it or not, you are regarded as a veteran in this industry, you know, and, uh, you know, when people see you on stage or on screen, they know they're getting a seasoned performer who's going to give them everything and more. I mean, when you started in this industry, did you have sort of like a, a, a map, you know, as to how you want your your career to go? You know, did you have a a, a goal in which you wanted to achieve? This is how I want my, my career to pan out. And if so, do you feel as if it's worked out in that way? Or has it been more of a, a journey of discovery? Definitely a journey of discovery. So um, it actually starts a very funny story. Mm. There was this boy that I was in love with mm. and I longed to have him see my face on television. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so, I mean, that's not why I studied acting, but mm, that's why I wanted to be on TV <laughs> so that you knew what happened to me. Because yeah. we lived in Cape Town and we moved up to Pretoria and I ended up studying there. So, um, mm. I was just, you know, in mm. case he was wondering where I was, there mm. I was going to be on his TV. You know? <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think he ever saw it because in the meantime, he had moved to the States. So. Oh, goodness. Yeah. But, you know, everything happens for a reason. That's and um, I didn't have a plan. Mm. All I knew is that I needed to be... Um, fulfilling this lifelong desire mm. um, to to express myself mm. and to entertain, mm. you know. So there was no plan, and I was pleasantly surprised at how it all worked out, mm. you know. But um, um, it's the industry industry has really been good to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. it's it's a, it's it's not common where you get to meet someone who's spent the time that you spent in the, in the industry um, and still be able to stand toe to toe with, you know, names that are currently being brought up because it almost feels as if uh, it's all always about, you know, 
what's hot, what's in, you know? And as soon as you meet those personalities and those individuals who are beyond the trends, it really is, uh, you know, you know that you're walking with, uh, you know, a, a huge light. You're walking with someone who's uh, gone through the test. So it's just to give you a flowers, you know? Um, <laughs> but tell me, the move from Cape Town to Pretoria, how old were you when you guys, you know, mm, yeah, I was, a, I was 15, you know, I was very shy. I hardly spoke. I, um, I was extremely shy. I was terrified of saying anything to anyone to the point where one of my cousin's friends asked me, they said, girl, do you talk? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yes, I do talk. You know, mm. so, so, when, so it was a major move for me in terms of adjusting my personality. When mm. I came up to Pretoria, I was like, I'm not going to be that shy girl anymore. Mm. And then I found my voice, as it were, you know. Mm. I kind of forced myself. Mm. And then I started taking part in productions at school. Mm. And um, I really felt comfortable in the space. But I had done one or two things um, while I was in Cape Town. Mm. I mean, I was still young, you know. Mm. So um, I'd always known that this was the thing mm. that excited me. And this was the thing that made mm. me felt alive. Mm. And um, so the move to Pretoria was, was really great because I ended up going to school and doing school productions and then, and then eventually ending, ending up in, at uh, Pretoria University. I actually wanted to go to UCT, but I didn't get accepted. I was terrible. Mm. They said <laughs> I was so bad. <laughs> Little did they know. Little did they know. But it was, it was a good, in terms of, you know, I really do believe that everything works out for a reason. What happened was I ended up studying in Afrikaans which was not my first language. It was a language I heard at home. My mm. mom spoke Afrikaans. Mm. So it wasn't something you could formally, uh, I had to get formal training in it mm. at university level. So I struggled through three years mm. of language, but, but what it did was it opened up doors. Sure. Yeah, I did a lot of work in Afrikaans. Mm. And at some point, most of the work I did was Afrikaans. Mm. So in terms of where I ended up where I did, it's not always bad, yes, so you true. know, so mm. I'm very grateful for that experience and for that push into the Afrikaans industry. Mm. Because if you want to survive in this industry, you've got to be as versatile as possible. You have to, mm. you know, you've got to act, you've got to sing, you've got mm. to dance, you've got to direct and yeah. write and, mm. um, you know, be behind the camera, in front of the camera, you know, everywhere mm. Mm. Um, to be able to survive in this industry. Um, Voice, voice work is also very important as mm. an artist, you know. So there's so many things that we can do mm. or that we should do yeah. to sustain ourselves in this industry. And mm. I'm glad that that was my kind of in. Mm. Yeah. That's really wonderful. You know, one of the conversations that are constantly ongoing uh, amongst our peers and colleagues is how the vast difference between the Afrikaans fraternity, um, you know, in terms of the time the money that's spent into these productions as opposed to some of the English counterparts. Have you mm. experienced that? Um, you know, um, you know I, I think that because in terms of the platforms that we have, who's employing? Mm. SABC is not really viable. Yeah. And they used to do the bulk, bulk of the English work, yeah. right? Mm. Um, Mnet as well mm. used to do some work, but now there's DSTV, these Afrikaans channels, mm. and people have discovered obviously DSTV or, or Mnet or mm. um, multi choice. They, multi choice, mm. yeah, thank you. Mm. <laughs> They've discovered that the Afrikaans market is a lot more um, profitable yeah. than the English market because people are streaming now. Mm. We're all streaming. That's true. You know, so it's a very difficult space for places like SABC and for multi-choice at the moment. Mm. It's not an easy space for them to navigate. And so they've had to choose <coughs> what they're going to produce. And it's about numbers. It is. It's yeah. about numbers. It's mm. about how many English views do I have? How many English views can I capture? Mm. You know, what are they watching? We're competing on an, an international stage. Mm. We're competing with uh, fabulous... Um, Amsterdam and yeah. you know yeah, are we competing with Yellowstone mm. and we're competing with incredible works mm. um, from overseas and and sometimes you know we be, something like Shaka Zulu is an absolutely fantastic oh, yeah. production yeah. really yeah. good quality mm. work you know um, but we don't always have those budgets mm. you know so mm. it's it's a very very difficult space for everyone to navigate so in terms of where are the numbers who's watching 
Afrikaans, mm. you know. It's a no-brainer. Yeah, it's a I no think brainer. so, yeah. It's a no-brainer. Yeah. I mean, people have been saying there are some underserved markets, you know, some untapped gems. And they always talk about a bit of a, do you, well, you know, the, the fact that they feel that the Afrikaans, I mean, the colored fraternity mm. um, is not so much, is not represented as it should given their numbers. Do you feel the same way? Do you feel as if, you know, we could do more in terms of unearthing colored talent, colored stories, or, you know, I, what I th- it's to take? Mm. I think there's a big movement towards that, you know. Um, I just shot something last month, which yeah. was um, which was going to be on ETV, mm. and ETV is now starting a new soap as well wow. for the Afrikaans colored market. Sure. You know what I mean? So things have really, really opened up. The stories that are being told are not necessarily just, and and this is very difficult because when they see the colored market, the colored Afrikaans market, they see gangsterism, mm. violence, mm. all of those things. We're not. No, there's so much it's, more. There's so, there's you know, so if much you more. feed people a certain narrative, mm. that's what they'll buy. Mm. You know, mm. I'm not a gangster. My no, kids no. are not gangsters. <laughs> Nobody in my family is a gangster. Nobody's mm. murdered anyone. Nobody's on drugs, mm. you know. So I think that the narrative needs to change. And when you ask us, what are our stories? Don't box us into, Mm. this is your story and this is how it's going to get told. Because nine times out of ten, you know, these stories are written by people who don't understand our culture. Who see see us as one-dimensional beings, Mm. you know, who doesn't think that we have an entire story of success or beauty Mm. or love. Mm. You know, it's Mm. just about how do we get the gangsterism and the and the drugs in there, perpetuating the narrative, Mm. which is just sad Mm. and wrong. wrong. You know, um, so so one of the shows you mentioned Mm. that I'd worked on, um, I ended up sitting in a boat with some of my colleagues. And we were talking about how it was okay for people to write, different cultures to write for each other, Mm. you know, and two other people in the boat were advocating for, it's fine to write, as a white person, to write for black people. Why not? And then I asked them the question. I said, would you let me write about the Boer Oerloch? Will you let me write a white story for you? And there was silence in the boat. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So... I think that we really need to think about how we can uh, bring out the nuances of, mm. of a story mm. in the storytelling. That's mm. important. Mm. You know, mm. um, there's such beautiful stories about love, you know, or about, about family, about relationships, mm. you know, that can be explored as opposed to how did I murder this one and who was doing this drugs mm. and who was fighting whom and how many guns were in the show. Mm. We're not all about that. No, no. You know, so, and, and I'm sitting here saying how negative that is that, but I haven't written the story also. That's true. So I need to take responsibility mm. for not writing that story mm. as well. Mm. You know, I'm not innocent in this. Mm. But what I'm liking about like this new wave of creatives, you know, young actors, um, and people behind the, the cameras, you're finding a pe- people are, are much more convicted with telling their own stories. So you get these young guys, you know, yes, he's a gaffer, but he's got a story that he's writing. A lot of young creatives are stepping into the space and saying, look, I want to represent where I come from. And I see it especially within the comedic, comedy space. Most of these co- you know, comedians are in fact writing their own stories, which is, which is something that, you know, it really does bring a smile on my heart. Because as much as I am multifaceted as a creative, I know writing is quite a special, it's a special gift. Special. Eh? It's, it's, not, it's, it's specialized. So, I mean, I've tried to write a few scripts and I could tell, no, <laughs> this is not going to cut it. So don't be too hard on yourself. But uh, I think you are right when you say, you know, these stories that are coming up are very important mm. for the self-image of, of the colored community because it's a beautiful community with, with like a, a whole collage of different influences and the food and the, the love that you get when you go to any colored event, family event. You can feel like you're at home. 
but that's not what we're seeing on the screens. Exactly, mm. and and because our people are so mixed, mm. we're so so mixed. Yeah, that's true. Right? You know. Uh, from one end of your family to sure. the other. <laughs> it's a biryani right there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah. I'm, and you know what's great about what you're talking about now? Mm. You know, taking those stories and, and, and bringing them to life. Yeah. But there are writers out there. So, people are looking at that collaborative space. I do believe that young people are more open to putting things together yeah. And collaborating, I think that's very important and that's quite exciting, I think, in our industry where mm. um, we don't have to live in silos. Where we, there's so much of everything now. Mm. You know, mm. if you want to write a story or if you have a story, find a writer. There are people sitting without jobs or people who have got, sure. the, who've got the chops and who can write. So sure. speak, to, speak to people that know people. Mm. Let's put something together Let's get somebody who can shoot it for us. Oh. Let's get a producer that who can oh. do the pitching or whatever. Oh. You know what I mean? That's true. We need to start working together. Mm. Yeah. Mm. We really, really do. That's very important. Yeah. But when you talk about, you know, there's so much that's out there. Sometimes, um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of positive things that are out there and not so positive, you know, uh, that are inf influencing and affecting our industry directly. I mean, we've seen the rise of influences and yeah, I mean, on the one side, it's a good thing because you're able to monitor, you know, um, the eyes that are watching these people, the kind of content in which people consume. But uh, you find that the industry, especially that, you know, the execs are taking these people straight from the social media platforms and, and putting them, you know, in front of the camera. What's your take on influencers getting into our space? It's very sad because that tells me that Producers then don't understand that acting is a discipline. Yeah. It's a discipline. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I've sat around waiting for hours for an influencer to arrive to work. Sure. Walk in as if they own the space. It's all about them. Um, no apology. Mm. Not to the crew who's been there since, mm. since the sunrise. Morning. Since before Yo. sunrise. Yeah. Then the actors came in after that. Mm. Not an apology to anyone. So not understanding the respect mm. for the space that you occupy, not understanding the discipline that you are engaging with, not willing to learn mm. anything from the people that have come before you. Mm. You know what I mean? Not picking up a book, mm. watching a YouTube video maybe on mm. how to act the basics of acting, and there's mm. information out there, mm. you know. And it makes it so much harder for us as actors then, mm. as professionals. Now, I'm standing opposite somebody who doesn't know anything about the technical mm. side of, of, of television, of mm. shooting. They know mm. nothing. They've come in there knowing nothing. They don't care to know anything. They think it's easy. Mm. Um, in their minds, it's just too easy. And I, I always say that if you feed people junk... Yeah. That's all they're going to want to eat. It's true. If you give people bad quality, then they go, oh, yeah, this is really good. Mm. How many mm. times have you heard that? Yeah. Bad quality productions, mm. so great. But they wouldn't be able to tell you what it was about mm. because there was no thought mm. into character. There was no thought into excellence or being or, or you know, um, Doing the lines that was written by a writer. It's actually written by a writer. That person spent three hours trying to think of the perfect three lines. And then you went and trashed it and made it your own. And it's got no bearing on the story. So just the lack of understanding and the lack of want to being more professional. or Like, how do I behave in the space? Let me see how people behave here. Let me see what is expected of me. Mm. Let me have a meeting with the people I'm going to be working with. Mm. That grates me because now I'm going to work three times or ten times That's harder true. to accommodate for mm. the influencer who's got no idea what they're doing. Mm. So now I'm working ten times harder, but I'm probably getting a third of what the influencer is getting paid. And Do I, you know what I mean? And, and that's mm, not fair. That's not that fair. That really at all. isn't fair. And, it, and if it all if it becomes all about numbers, then they also need to. Then I think that producers need to be 
happy about the fact that the production's tanked. It won't tank, possibly. Mm. It'll get influences. I mean, it'll get the followers watching. Mm. But then what does the quality look like? Mm. You know, how happy is everyone with somebody that came three, four hours late mm. because they weren't feeling so lekker. They had a party last night and whatever the excuse. No, there's just, there's just, it's, for me, it's just sad. And there are some talented people out there mm. and there are people who are willing to learn. Mm. Absolutely. I open the door for them, but <coughs> don't tell me about a production. Also, we don't have a lot of money. Mm. You know, I mean, mm. I've sat on a set where one of the influencers says, oh, please, can you run down to the shop and get me some um, pistachios? Sure. We're sitting in Maboning. Wow. You want pistachios? <laughs> where? From where? What though? is a pistachio? <laughs> Let's start there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want pistachios. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. So somebody's now got to organize. It's like, no, mm. come on. Mm. But I, there's also this thing, you know, that... Um, a big mistake that we, we make is that we look at the industry in, in America and we try and copy and paste that into this space, you know? Um, the fact that you have been acting for so long, one would expect you to be, you know, to have a huge ego, to drive a big Mercedes Benz and to walk into a place as if, you know, you're the first citizen of a country. Um, and But that's not the case on the ground. That's not how you create longevity within the space. Do you feel as if what people are being fed uh, about what this, this, this calling actually is, is incorrect? And if so, what is this thing that we do? How would you describe it in your words? <laughs> um, it's uh, very difficult to put into mm. words. Like, what is this thing that mm. we do? You know, we get paid to do something we really love and that we're really passionate about and mm -hmm. that we will... They say the thing that is your calling is something you would do even if you weren't getting paid for it. True. True. I've done many a production where they're like, come, just can, please, can you do this? We just need... I was like, cool, what do you need me to do? Because I want to... Mm -hmm. I want to be a part of something that gives birth to somebody else's production. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I want to be something that you've been thinking about for years. Mm. And they're like, Ilsa, I want you in my production area. Mm. I really, you know, I've heard that so many times. I said, when it's there, it's happening. Mm. And things come to fruition. And it's, it brings me such pride to be a part of somebody's birth into the industry. Do you know what I mean? I was a part of, part of that education mm. on how this person has flourished and grown, you know. And yes, we don't have a star system. There are advantages and disadvantages to that, obviously. Um, you know, the, I don't even think that is going to be a thing anymore. The, the star stars system. are going to be the stars. The real stars are going to be the influences. Mm. That's where we're going, right? That is where it's at already. Mm. You know, they, it's, it's happening all over the world. And we need to decide. We need to know where we fit in and how we're going to navigate the space that we find ourselves in. Because... Mm. We're going to have to re reinvent ourselves, mm. honestly. Mm. We're going to have to, to some degree at mm. least. Um, and I don't, and I, you know, there's nothing ever stays the, the same. True. As much as we want it to, mm. nothing ever stays the same. Mm. So we've got to think about how we as performers are going to evolve with what's coming. Mm. Mm. Yeah. How do you think that reinvention looks like, um, ideally? I have no idea. Mm. I've spent... Since last year, you know, when AI came out, I was like, this is a dangerous thing. Mm. I was at a museum in New Zealand yeah. in 2018. Mm. And I saw these holograms of these actors acting out a scene. They were like this big. Mm. It was a little hologram mm. of these actors that have done, they've done a, they had done a scene. It looked mm. like a, a, a scene in a, in a theater. Mm. And they were, they were um, acting out a particular scene on a hologram this small. Mm. And that, when I saw that, I was like, oh, we're going to get replaced. Yeah. That was 2018. Mm. Seeing that in a museum, immediately I was like, we are going to get replaced. Mm. When do we start becoming holograms in the theater? Mm. True. You go to the theater, you see... Mm. Marcus and Ilsa performing on mm. stage, but it's not them, it's just their hologram. Mm. 
Mm. You know, and it's mm. right here. Yeah. That big strike that SAG AFTRA had, mm. that's still ongoing, mm. you know. Mm. That's where we're at. So I, ha I don't know where it's going. I don't know how I'm going to reinvent myself. Mm. I'm still thinking about it. Yeah. 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 It's, a very, it's a very tough space to be in because we're living in a time of such change that's happening in front of our eyes. I, I remember I was watching a, a film, I think it's a series on, on Netflix, called The Playlist. And it's about the story of Spotify and how it started and how it was a huge revolution for people to say, oh, now we've got access to all this music and that's great. But then what, what the, the narrative has not exposed is how, how the artists have been suffering. And I'm happy that the, the film showed that, you know, that uh, with all these inventions that are making content and music more accessible, that's one good thing about them. But the, the other side is what happens to the artist who's sacrificed their whole life to, to be able to sing, to dance, you know, to give you these stories. Um, you know, it seems as if this machinery is making artists less and less relevant in that bigger scheme of things. And that's a scary place to be. Very scary. Mm. Very, very scary. I mean, I worry about the kids that come after us. Yeah. You know, yeah, we still, we're at the tail end of true, what right? was a really great ride. It's true, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mustn't be negative, yeah, but, but it feels like that a lot mm. of the time, you know. And, um, and a lot of people are saying, yeah, it's still a machine, you know, mm. you have to input, you know, information for it to you know, output, but mm. we've seen what it can do. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they take my image um, mm. and, and use it on, and at, still at my very uh, mature age, I would still like to do an action movie. Yeah. You know, yes. <laughs> they'll just take my image, <laughs> do the action movie yeah. with the whole new body, you know, mm. and, and I, I really think we need to think deeply about what we are going to do as artists to create longevity for ourselves mm. in some way. We're mm. going to have to be out of thinking, far out of the box. That's so true. Yeah. Anything, any lessons learned from COVID on a personal level, on a career level, just when it hit us, what were you going through and, and how did you kind of, you know, your, your, how did you switch your thinking and kind of accept, yeah. you know? So 2020 um, left a lot of us on the back foot um, because we didn't know where it was going to go. And a lot of us have not um, recovered financially. So it was a big blow to all of us. What I did learn from that is that we need to learn how to save. It's true. <laughs> we need to have a little money put aside with every gig that we do. Mm. We need to put something away mm. in an account we can't touch it, mm. or we are disciplined, mm. or, you know, and even if we had money for six months, mm. it went on for much longer than that, you know, I'm not being able to work. Um, I think that was the big lesson for me. Mm. But before that, I think I was very, I think I'm, I'm money savvy, yeah. you know, and not because I was taught about money. I was, you know, I think it's because I taught myself a lot of it. I mean, my dad did, obviously. He had his own business. And it was very hard, I think, in the 70s, 80s, and, mm. uh, you know, 70s and 80s to have a business as someone of color, mm. you know. It was tough. Mm. But I learned a lot from him, you know. And I think that that's the big thing it taught me, that you need to save. You need to be able to have other income streams, so for me, um, when I started out, and, and I'm just going to give a little bit of information yeah, away here. When definitely. I started out mm. as an actor, as somebody working in this industry, entertainment industry, mm. the banks are not going to give you a home loan. No. They don't want to see you. <laughs> they want to hear from you. They like you making these numbers mm. up. Don't lie. Mm. Go to SARS and get your tax return, and maybe we can think about it. Mm. But I would say to young people in the industry, in our industry. Mm. If you get a contract for just one year mm. with anything, whether it's a soap, whether it's a theater production, mm. whether it's something, and you're earning enough money, it doesn't have to be a lot. Mm. 
can be enough for a one bedroom flat. Yeah. You know, buy yourself a property. Because mm. I have seen artists who have been in the industry for many, 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 many years. Mm. And for me, the turning point was when I saw somebody that I really, really respected and somebody I'd seen perform everywhere. Mm. And I had to drop this person off because they didn't have transport, first of all, and also they were staying in somebody's backyard mm. at the age of 50. And that for me just was like, I don't want to do that. Mm. I don't want that to be my reality. Mm. And when I was 28 years old, I bought my first property because I was working at Isidingo. Dingo. Yeah. It was the first time I had a permanent job. I was like, yep. Yeah. Mm. I went to the bank within like three or four months of yeah. landing the gig, mm. you know, and I got my first home loan. Mm. And that house has paid off now. This was many, many, many sure. years ago. Mm. It wasn't easy. Mm. But I also say, you know, if you buy, it's a long-term investment. I've made 10 times mm -hmm. what I paid for it 20 years ago. And it's a long-term plan. So I've always, in terms of finance, thought about there, about my re retirement. I mean, we don't get to retire as mm. performers or people yeah. in this industry. You just sure. don't retire. You just mm. fall down dead at the job, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, that's the gig. Don't say you work that. until you can't <laughs> anymore. But also there's like illness. Mm. You know, anything can happen to you. True. And I was just like, I don't want to be that guy that ends up, you know, um, having to beg for help when, I've, when I'm somebody that people are supposed to look up to. Mm. You know, so for me, that was the first thing. And then be, just before I left Isi Dinga, I bought a second property. Mm. You know, so I own two properties. Mm. And I can't tell you how much money I've made off both of them. Mm. And it's not been easy, mm. but you don't also have to lose that property. That's true. You can Get a tenant. rent it out. That's true. You shouldn't live. You can go and live in somebody's mm. backyard, but you have something that mm. if you want to sell along the road somewhere, that's hundreds of thousands, true. even millions these days, in true. your pocket. That's true. I'm talking about a one-bedroom flat. Mm. You mm. know, simple. You don't mm. have to live there or buy something like if you bought a house, if you mm. could afford a house. You've got a year contract. You've got that money coming in constantly. Mm. You buy a house with a cottage. Mm. You rent out the cottage and the cottage is paying off the, mm. the house, you know, for mm. me. So that was important to me. And then I also discovered investing in something like easy equities. Yeah. There's so much information out there these days. Mm. Easy equities, you can get it on your Capitec app. Mm. You can, um, you know, there's, there's the website that they have and you can buy shares. Mm. But there's so much, there's so many podcasts, there's so many mm. YouTube videos, there's so mm. many people you can follow on Instagram talking about finance. It shouldn't be that hard. But the problem is, is that a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of the people that are up and coming, they are the first generation of people who are earning good, good money. money or real money mm. or, you know, not struggling hand to mouth, mm. not struggling. Mm. Yes, hand to mouth, but not like, yeah. you know, yeah. um, having to make the decisions True. about what we're going to eat tonight. Mm. Do you know what I mean? We've come further than that. A lot of us have. Mm. Some haven't, but a lot, a lot of us in, in the industry have. But nobody teaches you about money. If they don't know about money, how are they going to teach you what to do? But there are platforms online that you can learn. I'm reading something called um, The um, um, Financial Feminist at the mm. moment from mm. this 28 year old girl that mm. made millions in like two years. Read. There's mm. a lot of information, sure. you know, and then just think about, and you don't have to put a lot away. Mm. It's a hundred bucks. Mm. And get also something like an, uh, um, a retirement plan, mm. you know, where you're just putting money into some kind of retirement funds that will mm. pay out eventually. And the younger you start, the easier it gets. Remember, you can't lose that money. That's it's true. not like a life insurance policy mm. where if you don't die within, mm. you know, <laughs> and nobody getting that money, but that money, the hundreds of thousands are gone. If you put it into a retirement mm. fund, you can never lose that money. Mm. You know, but there's also like savings account, high yield savings accounts, mm. Capitec mm. savings. They've got so many products there. Mm. Put your money away for five years. Yeah. 
leave it, make as if it doesn't exist, mm. but put something away mm. um, because of the instability of our industry. We just mm. need to be conscious. And leave that BMW and that Mercedes Benz, why? Why are you drinking uh, Moet and yes, Chandon? True, why? JC LaRue on is the, so on cheap. The, <laughs> <laughs> on the boat. It's because true. you're taking photographs for whom? Mm. Why? Mm. Are those photographs paying for your rent? Are they paying for the things that you need at home? Are they putting food on the table? No. You need to be savvy. Stop living up to the idea of what you should be. You don't have to drive a BMW, man. Mm. It's just freeing petrol and when it breaks, it breaks. Yeah, so stop living up to the image that everybody else wants to see you be. Mm. Live up to your own standards. Live by your own standards. Mm. And stop thinking that you need to show the world because when somebody comes knocking at your door and they want their money, where's the world? You're, You're standing alone, alone with that yeah. guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. So think for yourself. Mm. Don't, you don't have to show off to other people. Did you have to build that muscle, that, that sense of, you know, blocking out the world's perception of you? And I'm, and, and I'm assuming is because of the grounding that you've had, you know, growing up with the kind of father that you did, the family, the household that you grew up in, you know, it was really, um, you know, you, they, they taught you a lot of discipline from a young age, whether it was for a, a conscious effort or it just happened subliminally. Uh, with some people, I get to feel they feed off of, you know, the fame. They feed off of, you know, like when I'm walking with some colleagues such as yourself and people are like, hey, I can see it almost like kind of makes you want to go. Then you're like, okay, this is my duty. Hi, how are you guys? But with some people, when people are rushing to them, it feeds their ego. It feeds their fire. Mm. You know, so I think for those personalities, it might be different. Do you think it's your upbringing that helps you have that, you know? No, I don't think it's my upbringing. I think it's just who I am. I don't have any, I don't have an ego. Mm. I, I just true. never. That's true. You know, it's yeah. never something that's, I've always been about the work. Mm. If somebody came up to me and said, wow, um, because, you know, people come up yeah. to oh, I love you so mm. much. They can't <laughs> tell what you were on. Exactly. They can't remember what you did. <laughs> they just saw you somewhere, exactly. so you must be famous. Mm. When somebody, if somebody comes up to me and say, you know that work that you did in mm. Unseen or mm. Isidingo or, mm. or wherever, Scorched, or, mm. or scorched that scene touched me so much. Mm. Thank you. Mm. That is a compliment. Yeah. That feeds my ego. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? I For it somebody too. who doesn't have it. It's like, yeah. yo, you saw my work. Yeah. You didn't see a perception mm. of who you thought you wanted me to be. You actually mm. saw my work. And that for me is always going to keep me grounded. And you must remember that, and, and as this industry goes, you up there the one day and then tomorrow nobody remembers you. That's so true. You know, That's nobody so remembers you. That's so true. So what is important? To be important to the people or to be important to yourself mm. and to remain true to yourself? Mm. Because they're going to go, weren't you that guy that was on, um, mm. I can't remember. Yeah. yeah, man, I used to love you so much. Yeah. They, can't, they don't know. Mm. And now you're driving a BMW to impress these people that mm. don't really know. Mm. They are fans, they've watched, mm. and we appreciate them because without them we are nothing. Mm. But we don't have to get fancy. Mm. You know, and if you if that feeds your ego, great. Mm. But remember, those people are going to be gone when the bills need to get paid. Mm. You know, mm. it's up to you. Mm. Yeah. Ever think about you know ageism in our space, um, which is a reality that it seems as if you know there's a you know the young actors obviously they, there's a whole hoo ha, and as soon as you 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 hit a certain age. Uh, you kind of get sidelined. They get the younger actors to play the older actors for some, or they, they play, you know, the older characters. What's your take on, on ageism and, and, you know? Yeah, um, look, I, uh, you know, it is what it is. Mm. It's like, once again, producers or, you know, mm. people who are the decision, and sometimes it's not your producers, it's actually channels. Yeah. that are making these decisions about, oh, yeah, take her. She's got 1.5 million viewers. Mm. Yeah, no, this one doesn't have any, I mean, a follower, sorry, mm. and this one doesn't have any, mm. got like 4,000. So they're choosing between who they're going to employ. Mm. So the landscape has changed completely. And what we mustn't forget is that we still need to make stories about older people. 
Why not? That's true. There's a huge Massive. group of people Massive. that sit in front of their TVs mm. and it would be really nice to see things mm. about themselves. And they're loyal viewers, eh? Very loyal viewers. Mm. They were there from day one. Mm. You know, so why isn't there anything for them? Mm. Americans get it right where they do something like Frankie and mm. I don't know what's the other character. There's like a comedy of these older women, you know. Yeah. It's like, yeah, mm. there's a space for that, mm. you know. So we need to celebrate who we are and where we're at at every stage in our lives. Because, yes, there is, a, there is that thing where you, you're no longer the sexy number, yeah. but you're too young to play the older yes. person. And you get, it's like late yes. 30s, yes. early 40s. Eh? Yes. Yes. Everybody goes through that. Mm. Where nobody knows where to place you. They want to, mm. they, they, you're like 32. Yeah. And then they put you with like kids that are 15. Mm. And you're going, I would have been 15 to have it. But, <laughs> you know, I would have, and then you, but the reality is mm. that's our industry. So mm. we need to adapt all the time. And, and um, you know, you really need to be, um, uh, just resilient, That's I think. True. This this industry requires it, resilience. resilience. Yeah. Now, the late Charlene Surti Richards was an actress who was well-loved and celebrated in South Africa. She was also a very good friend of yours. What What are some of the, the lessons that you learned from her life, her career, and also from, from her death? Yeah, she, I mean, she was a stalwart. She was the beginning. You know, she mm. is the original philosopher. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. And she did amazing work. And you know, she was a school teacher. Hey? Sure. She was a school teacher. No so many of the actresses those days didn't have a career or they were school teachers mm. or they, you know, so the older generation, there's another woman called Lulu Strachan mm. who, uh, you know, the people don't know them, but they all came up together and there weren't schools for them to go to. You know, drama schools for them to go to. And they became mm. icons. And Charlene, you know, her sense of humor did everything for her. Oh, yeah. She was funny, hey? Yeah, she was bigger than life. She was you know? so much larger mm. than life. She would walk into a space mm. and you would be rolling around. Mm. She would have the entire crew and cast in her hand, mm. rolling on the floor with laughter, mm. you know. Um, and, and what I learned from her is, is the fact that you can do so, um, you can remain authentic in terms of who you really are and bring that to the screen and still be lovable. Mm. You know, you don't have to pretend, you don't have to put on airs and graces and be that person. You can just be who you are and still make a good career of it. Mm. You know, never be ashamed of who you come from, never be ashamed of who you are and your upbringing and your background. Mm. Use that. Mm. That's still a part of who you are, you know. That's the one thing I learned and I also, and for me, the saddest thing was that Charlene, um, when she died, she, she, she was struggling, financially struggling. And this is a woman that spent 15 yeah. years or so on yeah. a soap. Mm. And, you know, and then she went to the next soap mm. and the next one. And I think that for me, there also, she didn't have any kids or anything, you know, yeah. no dependents and that kind of thing. So I suppose that's a different lifestyle. I think when you have kids, something changes in you and you mm. understand that you are now a provider. Mm. But I think that for somebody like Charlene, there should have been something. There should be a national fund. That's true. There should be a national fund mm. for the icons mm. that have entertained you for years and years and years and years. There should be a special pension fund or yeah, something true. that supports people who like Henry Tele, mm. like mm. Charlene Serti Richards, true. like, mm. you know, mm. the uh, the Toby Croniers, oh, yes. you know, you know what mm. I mean? Like the, um, like the people of old, you know, mm. there, there should be something for them at least, a special mm. pension, mm. because they were the people that you grew up with watching. Yeah, that's true. Have a little bit of respect. So mm. for me, it was like, in terms of, um, I think that, Finance in this industry is as important as having a job. Because mm. mm. you're going to need it down the road, whether you get sick mm. or whether you get old. Mm. Yeah, be mm. prepared. Yeah, man. Yeah, those are big lessons that we need to, to really take heed of. Thank you mm. so much for that. So, I mean, Ilsa, now that we've mentioned that, you know, we are living in changing times and things are constantly moving, how do you envision the change that you want to see? You know, what, what changes would you like to see in this space? I think for me, the craft will always be important. Mm. The craft of acting, mm. the understanding that this is a discipline mm. 
and that it is, you know, every script is an in-depth study, yeah. you know. Um, we're not just saying words on paper. There's a story that we're telling, mm -hmm. and there's a way of telling the story. So for me, the craft of acting will always, always be important. Mm. Um, that's always going to be number one, and I want to see more of that. I want to see that producers or that, you know, we start looking at the stories more than we look at how many people are going to see it. Yes. I mean, that's impossible, right? <laughs> but um, it would be really great if the, if the standard of the work, especially in South Africa, of the quality of what is good, mm. what is good TV, mm. what is good streaming, what is good theatre, mm. when that standard can go up again mm. to where it used to be, mm. you know. Um, and I suppose it's longing for the past, but also just keeping not feeding people junk and then expecting them to just eat the junk and then we're all just doing junk and then mm. the quality of everything is just awful. Mm. So I really want the standards to be what they should be mm. for people to be able to recognize what good work is. Mm. I don't want to see standing ovations at an opening night if a show wasn't good. Yeah, it's true. I right? don't want to see that. That's mm. also a space, I, a space I'd like to reimagine. Really give kudos to where something's really excellent. Mm. Stand up for it. Don't just stand because that's what's expected. And I think that the, for, for, for me, that for the young people to, for the young actors, mm. for the really talented people to really be given this space instead of having to count on how many followers they have on social media. Mm. Because as things change, I think social media is also going to change. That's true. I think many years from now, it's gonna be something of the past. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I'd like to see real actors and r real uh, uh, people that don't have to put their asses out and their tits out true. on social media so, so that they can get a job. So true. They can just be actors. Mm. Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, brilliant. We I didn't have to see another woman's boobs mm. that I know and respect as a performer, mm. but now, mm. anyway, that's that so for true. me is a reimagining. Yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> but you mentioned Charlene's generation. Yes. And how that generation also kind of informed, you know, your approach, you know. Do you feel as if also the youngsters today are kind of cognizant of the work that was done before them? I think this generation is very self-absorbed. Oh, yeah. I think as we were, I suppose, mm. in a way, when we were doing our thing, you know. Okay. I think every generation as young people are self-absorbed. <laughs> I think that's how nature works. Mm. But the realization is that I can learn. Mm. Don't close yourself off to learning. Because yeah. when you're on set with somebody who's gone through the trenches and has come to where they are, they didn't get there by fluke. Mm -hmm. They've done something. Watch and mm -hmm. learn. Always be open to learning. Mm -hmm. Because when even I have mm -hmm. learned things. Mm -hmm. I learned things from younger people, Ooh. and it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it's energizing, and, mm -hmm. it, and it gives me the courage to go on and, and mm -hmm. to be better myself yeah. because they're watching. Mm -hmm. They're always watching us. Mm -hmm. And if we put up a good example for them, then there's something for them to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> now we're moving to a, a more exciting, uh, you know, segment of our show. It is now game time. Our next game is called Either Or. Right. So I give you two similar options and you take your pick and uh, we just want to gorge your taste. It's like <laughs> a, an adaptation of who you'd rather. It's a different game, um, you know, um, but yeah. So you make your choice and then you'll tell us why. Okay. Alrighty, first question is smaller productions. Do you prefer smaller productions or bigger production work? You know? Smaller productions because there's more personal attention. Oh. Um, you know, there's a more intimate relationship mm. with everybody around, and the work quality seems to be better. Yeah, sure. Wow, funny. I was telling my producer, Psst, she's going to say big production. <laughs> well, big budgets, yeah. <laughs> big budgets, all yeah. All for big budgets. <laughs> but the actual craft. It's like going to a nice cozy restaurant when yes. you know the meals are being made with love. With love. Yeah, it's true. It might not be like the fanciest table, yes. but that little scratch on the table adds something to the aesthetic yes. and the beauty. I get what you're saying. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, cool. International plays... 
Ching Ching or local place. <laughs> International place, yeah. yeah. International yeah. place. I think that you know uh, the there's such an appreciation for theatre yeah. overseas. It's massive. On a Tuesday night, the theatre in London is packed. Oh. Yeah, Tuesday you cancel. Oh, no, no. <laughs> that's, that's a day where you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know the last production we did together, we had like six people <laughs> on exactly. a Tuesday. Yeah. So yeah, yeah for man. people to see the work for sure. Mm. Awesome, 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 awesome. Okay, here's one. Okay. Soapies. I want to add something else, but I'll just say, you know. Soapies or telenovelas? Hmm. Aren't they kind of the, the same? same? They're similar. So, They're oh, very, yes, very similar. Yes. From my understanding, and I think we get it wrong in this country, mm. telenovelas are supposed to be... Um, almost animated it's yeah. the productions are yes. big what oh no yes. they're melodramatic yeah that's a telenovela mm. the way i understand it mm. but now they just become soaps no they're soaps i mean and if you look at telenovelas from the mexicans yes and, it's you know huge. it's huge you know it's over dramatized yeah yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah. language is big everything is like mm. oh <laughs> that's sip <laughs> <laughs> do you know as opposed yeah. to you know? Yeah, it's true. That's a it's telenovela. True. It's true. Kind of like the style we were doing in the recent production with, uh, yes. uh, with UJ, right? Yes, Everything that's was, right. was... It's a little bit know, yeah. extra. Yeah, no, I like it's true. that. Yeah, I like telenovela. It. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the true form, the true essence, guys. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, this one. Classical acting or method acting? Oh, that's difficult. Method is so deep and so destructive, I think it can be. It's self, you know, you have to mutilate yes. yourself. I mean, not necessarily, mm. but it becomes kind of isolating for the people around you mm. when, you know, you're still walking around with a wound mm. in your heart, you know, for three weeks while the play is still on or the television. So I would say, um, I would say method. classical. All oh, right, classical. <laughs> yes, yeah, not method. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do feel like, especially when you're younger and zealous and, you know, you'll do anything to try and touch that, that you know, that yeah, space as a yeah. carrier, as a, as, a, as a performer. But yeah. after a while, you realize, sure. I, it I, takes its it, toll it, on it you. It takes its toll. It eats you. You mustn't yeah. be fooled by theater productions there. It can work on your soul. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You need to be very careful and sure. very aware of who you are and who the character is. So true. All right, uh, cake net or M net? M net. Okay. <laughs> I mean, cake net are my employers Boom, a lot that's of the what time, I'm thinking. but M net. Yeah, okay, yeah. And that's by virtue of you being more English speaking, <laughs> I'm assuming. Uh, okay, here's one crime films or drama films? Drama, Not for sure. sure. Mm. Yeah. Why? Drama, I just. Because I know what it takes to get to the drama. I know where you have to go to bring that story across and to tell the story. And I like that place for myself. So yeah, definitely drama. I love that. I'm also very much about those interpersonal relationships. Yes. Those, those real nuances. You yes. Know. And one, going to the depths mm, of that the character. The depths of it, you know. One to thing, seeing a staring do this and hit you. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow. I mean, I'd like but, to do yeah. that also. You know but what I'm I saying? Yeah. Drama, yeah. It's more about that. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. Here's one. A bit complex, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you'll get it. South African TV pre-2010 or post-2010? Yeah, hey, I think pre-2010 was the golden age. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I definitely think it was the golden age, you know. Yeah. We had all of these wonderful stories, nuanced stories, important stories. Because, because we were still in that fresh True. hub of like, we now out of, um, you know, mm. out of apartheid. So yeah. we're still telling those stories. Yeah. And there was a sense now, of mission, isn't it? Yes. Even if it was comedy, but... Yes. Could, there was a there was a, a bit of a, a, a um, what do you was call meat it? Patriotism in it. There was meat in it. Yes. You know? We are. Yeah. There yeah. was a joy and a sadness. It was very. It was. It was multidimensional and mm. and complex. It wasn't simplistic and just feeding into numbers, mm. which is what everything does now. Yeah, man. It's, it's just about numbers. Man, it's a hectic. Yeah. Alrighty. Uh, here's one. Tzotzi or Jerusalem. 
<laughs> I really liked Tsotsi. Okay. Yeah. I really did. Yeah, yeah. I really did. Yeah, there was, was something beautiful mm, about that story. Just the simple essence of it. Mm, you know, I really liked it. Makes you also yeah. think about, you know, transcribing some of these great plays mm. and these novels into film. Because that's, that's what it was. So it's, people don't know that it's actually a play. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, and we've got such great plays that still yes. need to kind of be relived and, and reimagined. Such so, a beautiful yeah, story. It really is. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. What is your all-time South African film? And oh, why? my goodness. That is a very difficult question. Mm. Oh, I don't, I don't know that I have. Mm. I don't know that I have a favorite yeah. South African I film. I guess it's isolating, right? If you yes. like this one. I mean, yeah. I loved Poppy Nongene was beautiful. Oh, wow. There's so yeah. many beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a reason, that was like the past five years. That was a couple of years ago. Yes. Yeah, yes. it was I so think, beautiful. Wow. You know, um, gosh, I have to, you know, I have to go back into the archives of my brain here. Mm. Um, Pick a few that have kind of just, you know, Yizo Yizo was cool. I mean, it's oh, not yeah. a film. It was a series, yeah. but Yizo Yizo was It was a mad. landmark. It was. Hey. It was crazy. It really was. And it was, it was a revolution in terms of film, you know. And then there's also Disgrace, which was the Dion... Um, what's his name? It was the film. Yeah. John Malkovich came out to okay. shoot that, yeah. Okay, interesting. Disgrace. Um, it was a book. Mm. Um, I don't know, hey. I'm, when I get home, I'm gonna go. Uh, yeah, this know. one and this one and this one. That's how it happens, eh? I know. I mean, those are yeah. just a few I can mention. Yeah, right but Ilsa, yeah. thank you so much for joining us on the show. Um, you know, recently having worked with you was a real live masterclass. Every day, getting into the space, and I could see your energy change from the beginning. Yes, we were playful. Yes, we were, you know, giving and receiving. But as we got closer. You're, you just went so sharp into that space, you know? And as a younger performer, you'd always feel, okay, all right, this is this is serious and I have to step up. And you really, I, th I would say one thing about your leadership quality is that you lead by action, you know? I was expecting, you know, a school teacher because we were working with students, right? <laughs> and not once did you ever scold anyone. But when they were out of line, they could tell it's time to now get yeah. it right you know so thank you for sharing your time with me in that space i know we were paid actors but it just it it reminded me you you reminded me what it's all about um there's a sense of purpose and mission in how you approach the craft and i'll be eternally grateful for teaching me that thank you for coming it's my pleasure thank you so much it was lovely to work with you too yes ma'am thank you thank what you. a pleasure to have been on this uh, podcast thank you thank you sir we would like to say thank you to fortune well the dynamic workspaces as well as the magic light box company for sponsoring this episode